So that happened. Hi everybody. Welcome to the Free Range Diva. How's everyone today? Uh, when I started this channel, it was because I hoped that I could offer some help to people, whether it be helpful solutions to problems or a distraction when I had no solutions. Um, rarely do I sit down and just talk to you, but today that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I've spent the last, it's been a month since I've actually sat down in front of a camera because I do tape ahead and during that time uh, a lot has happened and I've taken the time to really process and think about what I wanted to say when I did get back, you know, when I did come back on. So this is it. So today I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> when I saw the video, uh, like you, I had dramatic emotions and feelings about what I was watching. Um, I'm a 64-year-old black woman, grew up here in Los Angeles, and uh, you don't live that long without seeing a lot. I grew up watching our leaders gunned down, beaten, jailed. I was nine years old when Watts happened, the rioting in Watts, and uh, at the time, I lived in South Central because at that time, uh, Negroes, as we were called back then, were only allowed to live in certain areas of Los Angeles City, basically Central or South Central, what we call South Central. I believe it was called Central back then, Watts and Compton. And when I uh, saw the images, the black and white images of, of what was going on, of the rioting, I remember thinking how uh, glad I was. I was scared, of course. My whole f my family was like glued to the TV, and clearly something disturbing was going on. So uh, I was, yeah, I was frightened, but I was also really happy that it wasn't happening here. It wasn't happening in my neighborhood. Well, so little did I realize at the time that it actually was happening just a few miles south of where we were. Later, uh, when it was all over, my parents did take me so that I could see. So, yeah, Watts as a child and the Rodney King riots uh, as an adult. So when I saw that, that video, I felt, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't enraged. I passed rage years ago. I just felt a profound sadness that yes, it's happening again and again and again. And I, I anticipated, okay, there's probably gonna be civil unrest in, in uh, Minneapolis for a few days, maybe a few weeks, and then ultimately things would just, you know, the country and the media and everything would just move on. So when I saw the next day, millions of people taking to the streets, of all colors and nationalities across small towns and major cities in the United States and the world, it was like watching a miracle. It was just the most incredible, amazing, seeing the whole world acknowledge that this man's life mattered. Mr. Floyd, was a man who was loved by his family, by his community, by his friends, and by all accounts, he was a good man. Maybe not perfect, but a good man. And somehow, this feels different. Racism, which is finally defined by Webster's, <laughs> the power to inflict your prejudices and biases on other human beings to your benefit. It is, we all have prejudices, we all have biases, but to be able to negatively impact a race of people. You see, there is a special kind of hatred reserved for black people in the United States. It's called disregard. This system of racism, 
was designed with surgical precision to you're born into it. You don't even realize it's like breathing. You're indoctrinated to see or not to see or to feel or not to feel. And whether you're aware of it or not is irrelevant. Whether you feel you benefit from it or not is irrelevant. It exists. And it is impacting your life on a daily basis, all of our lives on a daily basis. This system is going to have to be dismantled brick by brick. And I guess policing how, how the uh, African American community is policed in this country is as good a place to start as anywhere else. Systemic racism is a system that is very complex, but I can give you a quick example of how it impacts uh, our lives on a daily basis. When the uh, stop and frisk policy was enacted in New York in the early 2000s, the idea was to reduce crime. According to the 2010 census, the racial makeup of New York City at the time was 33% white, 26% black, and 26% Hispanic or Latinx. In 2011, when stop and frisk was at its height, with almost 700,000 people stopped, the racial makeup of those who were stopped was 53% black, 34% Latinx, and 9% white. They literally, police literally had to cut through a sea of white individuals to get to the one black youth in a hoodie and a backpack so that they could throw them up against the wall. Now, it is highly unlikely that New York police were trained, were told, don't bother stopping white, white men and women. You know, ignore them, only go after the blacks and the Latins. But that's what they did. No, I'm sure they were not told that, but that is exactly what they did. And the reason is the belief perpetuated by this idea of systemic racism that blacks and Latins are, that people of color are somehow a threat and white people are safe. And to put a pin on that, in that year, as in every other year since the policy was instituted, Almost 90% of those individuals that were stopped had nothing. They were innocent. I can remember hearing uh, um, this young black kid talking about how he got stopped all the time. In school, at least on a, almost on a weekly basis, to the point that he didn't even want to go to school. Did you see the footage coming out of Buffalo uh, a few weeks ago? What is it? in police training that requires you to check your humanity at the door when you put the uniform on. Dozens of police officers stepped over an elderly man lying in the street, bleeding from his head. They continued walking past this man. Nobody stopped. The few who, I mean, common decency would seem to say, if you see a man laying on the pavement, regardless of how he got there, clearly injured, you would do something to help. Uh, maybe just let him know, sir, I'm right here. Help is coming. We're not just going to walk right past you and leave you here to, 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 to bleed out in the middle of the street. I'm going to stay with you. you just please stay calm. Help is on the way. That would be the common humane thing to do. And any of us would have done exactly that, but not, apparently, if you are part of the Buffalo Police Department. Even those few officers that had that instinct to want to help the man were either pulled off or stopped themselves because their training required them to stay in formation, to not respond like a human being, to respond like something else. You see the problem. This was not one bad apple. This was 57 officers who resigned from their unit to protest the punishment of the two officers who pushed and walked away. What is it that allows three officers to continue kneeling on a man in broad daylight while their training officer slowly 
torturously chokes the life out of him with his knee on his neck. What is it that stopped them from intervening as they slowly watched over the course of eight minutes and 46 seconds, a man beg for his life and then lose consciousness. And still they remained two minutes after he lost consciousness. What is that? Did they not think, were they thinking, what were they thinking? Should we do something? Should we, should we say something? Should we get up? D uh, or just shrug their shoulders and like, well, this is what we're supposed to do. Disregard. We know why that one officer put his knee where he did and stayed there. Because he'd done similar things 18 times before and the system did not punish him for it. But the other three? I'll never understand. So the system that encouraged all those officers to walk past that man as he was bleeding in the street. The system that allowed four officers to choke the life out of a man who was begging for mercy. That system has got to be changed. And change is messy. It's uncomfortable. It's requires conviction, determination. You have to push and push and push. Because in 1992, after what happened here in LA, yeah, choke holes went away, only to re be replaced later by carotid artery restraint. Basically, no longer cutting off the air to the brain this way, rather cutting off the blood supply to the brain this way. The result is still the same. Fire hoses and police dogs have been replaced by redlining and redistricting. Outright denial of your right to vote has been replaced by something more subtle, voter suppression. And I am so grateful to those people who have stepped up, to the American people as a whole who have said no. No, no, no. We're going to have to change the way we think. We're going to have to change the way we perceive, the way we act. To my viewers of color, I ask you, does this feel different to you? I mean, it feels different to me, but I mean, does it feel like, like maybe this time people are going to be treating us fairly? That maybe justice for all is finally within reach to my white viewers. Are you up for change? Do you want to be a part of this? I mean, I figure you probably do. Otherwise, you certainly wouldn't be watching this channel and you definitely would not have gotten this far into this video. If you are, because the bottom line is that we are all one people. We are all one race. It's called the human race. And we all have one ancestor. And if you want to know more about that, you can Google mitochondrial Eve. There are so many uh, resources and places you can go to get more information. Um, I encourage you to look on YouTube for any videos about Jane Elliott and her brown eyes, blue eyes experiment. It will open your eyes. It opened my eyes and I thought, hell, I've personally experienced racism. There's not a whole lot I need to know. Um, but no, but even I have been learning. I've been learning a lot over the last week. If you wanna be an activist in this movement and you can't march, you know, I, I'm a marcher. I have marched a lot, but I have not been able to march this time because COVID, my mother's 89, I live with her, and she is like terrified of that disease. So I could not risk bringing that home to her. So I didn't march. I haven't been marching. But you can sign petitions. You can contribute to, to uh, causes. You can talk 
to your friends and talk to your neighbors and, and uh, your family members. Sit down and have some frank conversations about race and about your thoughts and feelings on race and whether or not you might be a racist. Because in this country, with our history and so burdened by uh, the legacy of blacks and slavery in this country, you can't help it. It's not your fault. You were born into it. It's just a question of being willing to open your eyes and actually see it. So that is going to do it for me today. I'll be back in a week with regularly, albeit uh, more racially um, introspective programming. Uh, and so um, and in the meantime, if you want it, I really wanted this to be a conversation, but this is YouTube. We can't do that. We can't have a one-on-one. -on -one. But what we can do is uh, you can you know, know that if you have thoughts and you want to leave those thoughts in the comments below, those thoughts are always going to be respected here on this channel. And uh, I, don't, I, have, I have never tolerated disrespect, and I'm certainly not going to start now, um, which is, I don't know why I'm even saying that. You guys are wonderful. <laughs> But anyway, in, until I see you again in that next video, um, I'm wishing you an educational week and uh, good health, stay safe, and I will talk to you again very, very soon.